With the North Korean army surrounded, more happens off of the front that will forever be remembered as the Second Korean War. But first, let's recap on this conflict. After the shelling of Yongpyong Island on November 23, 2010, a North Korean colonel, hoping to gain favor with the Kim regime and higher-ups in the DPRK, attacked Yongpyong Island to take out the artillery positions that were decimating North Korean artillery as they were returning fire. South Korean Marines were ordered to reinforce the other Marines that were already stationed on the island and defend the artillery positions that were under attack by the North Koreans. Though the North Korean attack was repelled, the North Koreans were not done yet. That night, orders came down to sleeper cells and commandos who were operating in hiding in South Korea to awaken and execute a wide variety of missions aimed at destabilizing the South. This included terrorist attacks on high-profile targets and assassination attempts on targets like the one that took place at the home of the CIA's deputy station chief in Seoul. With South Korea in disarray, North Korea attacked the demilitarized zone early the next morning, crossing the DMZ in force with armor and heavy infantry. While the mines located in the DMZ did slow down the enemy forces, it alone wasn't enough to halt the overwhelming numbers of North Korean troops now pushing into South Korea. In addition to the troops pouring into the South, North Korean artillery posed a serious threat to Seoul and the soldiers on the front. The DPRK has a lot of artillery in their arsenal because it's cheap and effective. As major shelling begins, South Koreans and American forces make it a top priority to neutralize this threat. Aircraft from the USS Nimitz, among others, are tasked with destroying artillery positions across North Korea. As would be expected, North Korea would heavily guard these important assets from attack in the air. Despite superior numbers and technology, some pilots are shot down over North Korea. In those situations, search and rescue is called into action like the mission we saw by the United States Marine Corps. With each passing day, North Korea's advance continues despite stiff defense. While the advance is slow, they are close to reaching the South Korean capital of Seoul. One major push is all they need to get to the outskirts of the city, and North Korea's persistence pays off. The push is ordered and they break through the lines and have little resistance into Seoul. As North Korea advances, however, they are under constant threat from South Korean special forces who are operating behind their lines. They're attacking supply convoys, hitting enemy patrols, and hitting any other targets of opportunity to help keep as many troops away from the front as possible. These troops are leading the resistance. Unfortunately for the South Koreans, that is not enough to keep the North Koreans at bay as the army of the DPRK makes it to the gates of Seoul. The defenders are prepared for what awaits them as hostiles could be around every corner of the city. Urban warfare ensues, causing heavy casualties on both sides, but the North Koreans aren't able to advance too deep into the city. In response to the advance of the North Koreans, South Korea and the United States initiate an operation to eliminate Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un simultaneously in an effort to destroy North Korean leadership. With an organization so structured around so few, they expect such a mission to be highly effective. Knowing that Kim Jong-un will be visiting an airbase in North Korea, special forces from South Korea and the United States insert into North Korea via Ghost Hawk helicopters to confirm Kim Jong-un's presence. If confirmed, a missile will be fired to kill the leader and the special forces will quickly extract from the area. When that mission is successful, we see two factions vie for control of North Korea. One faction hopes to continue the Kim dynasty in the way that they had led the country. The second faction, backed by China, called for reforms to the country and also an end to the war. As these two factions vie for control, the advance of North Korea continued, trying to cross a bridge near Inbok Chon. The North Koreans hope to encircle Seoul and push on through the rest of the country. The U.S. 2nd Infantry Division makes a stand at that bridge that holds back the North Koreans on the western part of the front. On the eastern portion of the front, however, the U.S. 1st Armored Division helps the Republic of Korean forces to slow the North Korean advance despite taking heavy casualties themselves. The North Koreans are putting a larger focus on armor and mechanized warfare to achieve a breakthrough in this area. Again, that attempt is squashed due to the staunch Allied defense. In the rubble on the outskirts of Seoul, the South Koreans start to push back the North Koreans for the first time. Intelligence is reporting a large shortage of supplies and ammunitions for the North Korean forces in this area, and the South Koreans aim to take advantage of this. While there is still street-to-street -street fighting, the progress is real. The cause of this shortage is due to the infighting of these two factions in North Korea. Reports have been coming in to intelligence outlets that well-supplied Chinese-backed reformist forces are starting to attack the loyalist Kim regime. The infighting is diverting men and material away from the front and a massive offensive by South Korean and American forces is quickly put together. 
All across the front, Allied troops pushed through North Korean defenses, initially at great cost, but finding much less resistance than expected behind the lines of North Korea. This helps to not only increase the success of the offensive, but allows for reinforcements to be more available to assist in areas where the offensive might have stalled. The Allies have had air superiority for some time, and with the offensive, the Air Forces are taking part in more close air support sorties to help move forward this advance. What few North Korean air forces remain on the peninsula are no match for the air forces of South Korea and the United States, and of course are quickly shot down. The final part of this offensive called for an encirclement of North Korean forces who had little to no fuel to an attempt an escape. This was done by American paratroopers who landed behind enemy lines to prevent them from escaping, as well as a marine landing on the western part of the coast of the Korean peninsula. With the enemy encircled, it would be a matter of time before they surrendered. However, seeing that the end of the war was near, China knew that this situation could benefit them. After all, they did not want American troops right on their borders. The reformationist forces called for a ceasefire and an end to hostilities. China, once again, crossed the Yalu River claiming to be peacekeepers and claiming that that territory belonged to the newly created Socialist Republic of Korea, or the name of the reformationist group. The Allies were worried that the Chinese would attack them, but the Chinese stopped 20 miles away from the front and made no efforts to attack American or South Korean forces. With the Socialist Republic of Korea, China would have a puppet who would remain a buffer between the South Korean American forces, but could be more easily controlled than the DPRK was under the Kim regime. Despite not achieving total victory, the United States and South Korea were hopeful a less aggressive nation would form, one that they could build relationships with after the end of the war. With that in mind, and with the lack of desire to enter into a conflict with China, both the United States and South Korean forces stopped their advance. A ceasefire was brokered quickly, and eventually, a peace treaty was signed in 2011 that brought an official end to the hostilities. The war lasted exactly one month, but in that time many suffered, the casualties are as follows. For North Korea, 248,047 killed, 513,249 wounded, and 215,662 captured. For South Korea, 81,511 lost their lives, 129,883 were wounded, and 10,059 soldiers were captured. For the United States, 19,618 were killed, 33,870 were wounded, and 225 were captured. The civilians, however, paid the heaviest toll. 327,290 were killed, 542,992 were wounded, and 82,995 were either captured or abducted. So now we're going to take a look at the advantages of both sides of the conflict. The way I'm going to break this up here is into the two sides. I'm not going to break up South Korea and the United States advantages. For North Korea, one, they had a lot of numbers. The biggest challenge the Allies faced during this campaign was being able to hold back the overwhelming number of troops that were crossing into South Korea. This became less and less of an advantage as time went on as we saw reservists from South Korea be called up and reinforcements from the United States enter the combat zone. Two, the element of surprise. There have been a number of skirmishes that have taken place between North and South Korea over the years, however nothing as large as this. There were some that were in South Korea who didn't expect the North Koreans to attack, especially with that commando raid that we saw in episode number two. The North Koreans were able to take advantage of that and use the element of surprise to help them push into South Korea. Three, loyalty. It's no surprise that the North Koreans don't know what exists outside of their country. There's a lot of documented things that talk about what North Koreans think of South Korea and the United States. When they're fighting, they're fighting very passionately for their own survival. That's how they perceive this, which allows them to fight harder than you would see from just about any other foe. And now we'll take a look at the advantages for the South Korean American Alliance. Number one, technology. It's no big surprise that the technological advantage went to South Korea and the United States right here. In some cases, we saw fifth generation fighters go up against aircraft from the 1960s. But this heavily influenced the outcome of the battle, especially when you take a look at not only what happened in the air, but also on the ground and on the seas as well. Number two, supplies. Even if the North Koreans hadn't split into two factions and tried to split the supplies between the two, it still would have been an issue for North Korea without full backing from China. However, the United States and South Korea are very well supplied and were able to maintain their level of attack throughout this entire series and could have continued on 
for much longer as well. Because of that, they were able to keep fighting harder than North Korea could have, and that's what allowed them to make that heavy push at the end. Number three, international backing. It was the North Koreans who fired the first shots at Yongpyong Island, and they were the ones who crossed the DMZ. Any international support they could have had was gone. Because that they had lost that, there were sanctions that were increased uh, on them by a whole slew of nations, which made their supply problem even worse. Because the United States and South Koreans were seen as the good guys in this one by the international community, they had an increase in support. With such a high death count, it's difficult to see how such a war could have been worse. But you may have noticed that nuclear weapons were never used, as North Korea knew it would mean the total destruction of their nation and a further loss of any international support that they could have had. At the same time, China never actively entered the conflict. They too saw North Korea as a major issue and saw this as an opportunity to take advantage of the situation in a way that benefited them. Things could have been very different, and some analysis believe that it could have been different than what we saw here. With the new Socialist Republic of Korea in place, however, there is hope that things will begin to not only return to normalcy on the Korean Peninsula, but hopefully there's the possibility of greater peace in the future. This was the Second Korean War. <laughs>